Welcome everyone, thank you for attending. Sorry I had to miss last week. I'm sure Kelly did a stand-up job in my, uh, in my absence. Um, we have been, uh, we've been taking the approach of uh, skipping invocations and national anthem at this point in time. Unless anyone wants to volunteer to sing, Deb, you got any ideas? Or not today. <laughs> not today. All right. Voice is shut. Yeah. I don't believe we have any guests with us, um, so we'll we'll uh, dispense with the welcoming of guests. Uh, announcements, Rotary information. Um, just the board met just before this meeting. And, you know, we're kind of in the early stages of a new board and, and kind of getting to know each other and that sort of thing. Um, you know, the highlights of that discussion for the club are, you know, we're kind of getting our arms around the, the, what, what the model looks like for the year um, because we're still meeting virtually right now. Um, we asked everybody if they had, uh, you know, any, any uh, you know, specific ideas as to when, when the pandemic was going to end. We were going to be back to normal and nobody had any answers. So we're, we're continuing to play this a little bit by ear. In terms of club members, I think, you know, if you have ideas as to how, how, we, might, uh, how we might adopt a new model going forward, um, by all means, share them. Um, you can share them with me or whomever uh, you're comfortable with on the board. Um, we, you know, we're going to have to look, we're going to look different uh, even, even when this pandemic ends. Um, uh, financially, uh, if nothing else, we're going to look different. Um, we, we, another topic of discussion during the board meeting was the budget. And, you know, if we, if we just went back to what we normally did, um, in terms of meeting at the, in terms of what we were doing, meeting at, at um, Whitewater and getting catered lunches from 2510 at noon. And we did that every, every week for this rotary year, we would lose about $11,000 as a club. So that can't work. So, um, uh, you, you know, now we're not doing that. We've already gone three weeks and we haven't had lunch from 2510 yet. So that's not going to happen. But what, what I think, Club members that need to need to get uh, get comfortable with is that we're you know the model is going to look different going forward no matter what the um, no matter what the state of uh, the pandemic is so you know think about what what you'd like to see you know in terms of a model and um, you know we'll we can share and have discussion about you know some of the things that we've talked about and, and bantered about. So um, give it some thought, reach out to me, talk by phone, whatever we can, uh, we can talk it through. So questions on that from club members at this point in time. No? Hey, so Matt. Yeah, Patrick, go you, ahead. Yeah. What would you think about, um, so let's see how many people are on today we got four times four so there's 16 people today so what do you think about uh, identifying some of the people who have not been participating since we've gone virtual and we reach out and give them a call or well, I'd, I'd suggest reach out and give them a call and just to ask them or suggest that they participate I think I think that's fine Patrick I know we reached out by uh, that survey, Deb, right? And that went to all club members, right? And, you know, we'll, we, um, we didn't get to that in the board meeting, uh, but we got some insight from, from members as to what, what they wanted, why they couldn't participate. One, for example, Patrick was, you know, they had a standing COVID meeting at that time that they finally got, got passed. So it's that kind of stuff. Some, I think there were some technology challenges as well, but certainly, you know, we can reach out to people and see why they're not coming. 
um, and uh, what the challenges are. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, you know, I, I guess I'll be blunt, Patrick. I'm less inclined to chase after people who aren't participating than I am thinking about what's going to, what are we going to look like in the future? And, and what, you, you know, what's going to be a model when we can meet in person that is going to work for this club, um, both from a, from a engagement point of view, as well as a financial point of view. So that's what I'm more interested in, in mm-hmm. focusing on. Um, so I have, I have a question. D- did I hear you right that if we were to meet at the Whitewater Cafe for the remainder of your year, we'd be 11 grand in the hole? If, if we met at Whitewater, which is free, and ordered from 2510, um, and 2510 continues to charge us what they were charging us for their catering, we'd be 11 grand in the hole. You heard me correctly. And that's doing everything else basically. And, and all the other stuff is small potatoes, quite frankly, but um, all the other stuff doing the normal stuff we do basically. So it's about 25, it's about, it's about 25,000 bucks, you know, round numbers to, uh, to get catering from 2510 for the year. Now we already haven't done that because we're three weeks in and haven't, uh, you know, haven't had a meal yet um, from 2510. (laughs) Is that based on, 100% 100% attendance or based on our average attendance? Average attendance, Jim. Yeah. Okay. Average attendance. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So if everybody attended, the deficit would be larger. Correct. Yeah. Because because 2510 was doing doing kind of a per, you know, the actual the actual attendees. So it just doesn't work. And, and again, it's not, I don't want to, nobody's going to, you know, we don't have to panic. We're going to solve this problem. But um, you, you know, it's, I think it, I think it, uh, gives us an opportunity to think differently about, you know, how we want this club to look and how, how, uh, how we can make it, make it work. So, um, Matt, does that also include the youth rotar participation? Is that where some of the lunch expense comes from? Yeah. Some of it comes from there, John. That's correct. Yep. And then funds also for the scholarships, I'm assuming, are still in there. That adds to it. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's, well, that's not, again, to me, when I look at the budget, I, I kind of, the stuff like scholarships and other stuff, I view as, you know, stuff we want to be doing. And um, quite frankly, it's smaller dollars in the great, great scheme of things. Um, it, it doesn't move the needle as much. The biggest, the biggest, cost item is uh is lunch so that's where you know we're gonna have to make that work somehow um you know and again as we as we learn more as we go forward in terms of where our um uh, you know how our meetings are going to look can we can we meet again in person in theory okay if we can what do we want that to look like so Hey, Matt, it's John Overland. Uh, I, I know we probably don't want to dive down a rabbit hole on the budget, but I'm just curious because I didn't hear anybody say, well, what's contributing to that potential deficit if we were to eat? Are we, did we miss a fundraising opportunity in the spring because of COVID? Because I haven't you know, been in the club long enough. I'm going to be barely at a year in the middle of September. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think it's so much that, John. You, you, it's, we, we, we've had a declining level of membership for a while. Okay. And, and that combined with rising costs of meals, you, you know, sort of, you know, last few years, we've kind of, kind of wrestled with that a little bit. So um, now I, again, I think there are some options, some alternative meal providers that could help us a little bit. We were, we were trying to target about 10 to 12 bucks per meal per person. And 2510, I think, thought they could come in at that level, but then there was probably a little more a little more involved than they anticipated perhaps. And they were coming in higher than that when we, right before the pandemic. So the, the biggest challenge is just, you know, numbers of people, um, no, numbers of members. So does that answer your question? It does. Yep. Yeah. And, and okay. I'm sure other clubs are struggling with it. The club that I was in in St. Paul was struggling with this before yeah. the pandemic happened. So, did they solve it? And if so, can we uh, copy them? 
Well, they moved to a new location like our club did <laughs> that was cheaper, if not zero, and then also reduced catering because, as everybody knows, that seems to be a higher yep. budget line you know, throughout the year. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. But I haven't talked to anybody recently. I just know they were, they were phasing to that last summer before I left the club. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, I, I, I think um, uh, we've got other folks. Kelly's gone through this in – you were in the Minneapolis club, Kelly, years ago, and you saw it go from 400 to 100, and they had to think creatively at that point in time too, right? Yes, they, they also moved location. Um, I'm not so sure it reduced their, their luncheon cost, but they, um, they reduced the number of, of times they meet during the month. I think they only meet three times a month now. And the fourth, the fourth week is a service project someplace else. Um, so it, it eliminated, you know, 12, 12 meals um, over the course of the year. And I'm not sure what other things they've done, um, but that, that's what little I do know now. So, you know, again, we don't have to, we don't have to beat this subject to death today, but that, that, those are the kinds of things I'm thinking about. And maybe we, we do think differently. And I'd, I'd like to combine this effort with, with more, you know, when we can, get together more kind of social engagement among club members. So those are some of the ideas that, that we're bantering about. Um, so if you have ideas, by all means, uh, let us know. And um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try to come up with something that's going to work for work for uh, as many people as we can and, and make this club, you know, continue for another hundred years. So, um, Okay, other questions on that? Otherwise, I think we can move to uh, happy and sad dollars, although we, I'm looking for, I don't have anyone in particular that's going to drive happy and sad dollars, but I'll ask, I'll maybe, uh, maybe play the role. <laughs> Any happy dollars uh, for, uh, for people today? No one's going to have happy dollars now because they know Deb's writing it down and you're going to get a bill. Right? Is that right? <laughs> I'll, I'll do a happy dollar. Ryan Nelson here. Uh, I was just happy that I finally went into my office for the first time in three months and found a note from the early bird club with a check for us for $1,400 in it. So happy that we got some revenue coming in. <laughs> so that was a happy, that was a happy $1,400, Ryan? Is that what that was? The club needs it. Yeah, it was, it was yeah, a good uh, surprise. <laughs> Embarrassing surprise because we could have deposited it a while ago. But that's right. That's good. I think that just for the benefit of the club, we talk about that at the board meeting. But I think that co comes from the uh, president's pantry, our, our, right. our proceeds from that. So, so that's good. Is that the money though that goes in for goes to the foundation from each of our bids and everything? I don't think there's any any obligation to put it in the foundation, Deb, that I'm aware of. That's what the president's pantry is for, is when you buy right. something, the money goes to the foundation in your name. To the Rotary Foundation, Rotary International Foundation. Rotary International Foundation, right. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah. I thought you meant the community foundation. No, no, not community foundation. Sorry, no. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. I have a question have because happy, my happy check dollar. was... Oh, you're good talking about. Well, Rosemary's got a question, then Jim's got a happy dollar. Yeah, I so Rosemary's question first. Okay, ladies, I guess ladies first. Changing from happy dollars, my check was made out directly to the foundation. So why would the early birds be returning money if the check was made out to the foundation? Yeah, that I was think so, why I asked the question. That's all. So it, it could be. Yeah, I think the I, I think there's there's a little bit of uh, I I observed that when I attended last last uh, winter, Rosemary. That I think there's a little bit of peeling back the onion, a little confusion about where those proceeds go and how they get there. Um, so, you know, you wrote a check. You said to the Rotary Fund, Rotary International Foundation. I'm sure they deposited it, and you took a tax deduction. I think that's all fine. No, I think this no. is. 
No? Mine came directly from my IRA. So it was made out by my IRA custodian directly to the foundation. Okay. Yet it has not been recorded yet at the foundation. Oh, it hasn't? <clears throat> no. Oh, okay. Okay. That's interesting. Well, I know Ryan was going to, Ryan was going to dig into, uh, he was going to talk to the early birds and get a little confirmation on the $1,400 and where it came from. I think, you know, Ryan, maybe on that front, having some additional conversation about how the proceeds go where they go and get where they're supposed to get. I mean, you know, when I bid on whatever I bid on, the liquor that I outbid Sean for, um, you know, I think I wrote a check to President's Pantry or something like that, right? Yeah, and that's, they gave me a spreadsheet. It has Rosemary's bid on there too. So this would have been a, a bid made on 223-2020. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you can. I'll get clarity. Ask some questions on that. So, you bet. all right. Jim, you had a happy dollar. Yeah. As you know, the, uh, the honor flight program has been suspended for this year, uh, which means most of the activities involved on the outside fundraising presentations and so forth also. But this weekend, um, Century 21 Gold Key and the Marshfield Country Club did their third annual honor flight golf outing. And it was uh, a wonderful success. They raised uh, $12,000, 12, $12, uh, which sends 24 more veterans. So. That's a happy buck. That's great. Congratulations, Jim. That's wonderful. Other happy dollars? I'll put in, uh, Deb, you can put down uh, 49 happy dollars for me. Um, that was, uh, somebody had, a, uh, had an event yesterday. So um, you can put that on my tab. Bladed happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, lip sync happy birthday. How's that? <laughs> That's fine. Lip syncing is fine, Jim, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, all right. Any other happy dollars? Matt, this is John. Yes. I'm always good for a happy dollar, too, but I wanted to... Uh, I'll throw in five for the kickoff of uh, our Hunger Plus event. I know that there's been mm -hmm. things out there on Facebook and other things that are beginning to circulate. So thanks to Patrick for that initiative. And not sure if he's got any updates or any feedback on what's happened, but the video with um, uh, Dave Eisenreich and Donna was nicely done. And I think I'm looking forward to some great outcomes from that. Yeah, maybe Patrick, that's great. So Patrick, maybe you can use that as a segue to give us a little update. Would you like to do that? Sure. Uh, you know, Dennis Tan would probably be a better person. Dennis, can you give us an update as to where we're at so far? Oh, Dennis, you're on mute. There you as, go. Of this, as of this morning, I think on, uh, uh, let me just pull up my pages here, but um, Facebook, we've got uh, a few donors. Um, I'm not really prepared for this. All right, so on our, on, on, our, on our United Way platform, of using the Harness platform, we've got two donors of a total of $37. Um, and on Facebook, we've got, we've raised $345. Uh, let's see, from five donors. So we're looking at about 370 from a total of seven donors. Okay. So that I don't have any experience with uh, Facebook fundraisers, but 
I'll, I will admit, seven donors and 380 bucks. It's a little lower than I thought we, where we would be. But maybe it just takes time for those shares to get out there. Yes. So uh, what I'm planning on doing is uh, continuing to promote it. Maybe this week I will share it again. Uh, just so that we can get more people out there. Uh, if you're on a Facebook page, uh, make sure you're, you're liking it. Try to follow us a little bit. Um, one of the things that I did last night or yesterday was actually invited uh, people to, to to the fundraiser. If, if since, I, since it's my fundraiser that I, I, I organized it, I invited people who are on my friends list. And, and we got an additional donation. Dave uh, Anderson from the, the early birds donated. So uh, I'm trying to get people on my friends list. Uh, if I can get more friends to friends uh, to follow me or like me, then you know I can invite more people. So it's one of those things where you just gotta keep the list growing and promoting people to to uh, to the page. Hey, Dennis, I have a question for you. Is it possible for me to invite people to that fundraiser or are you only able to do it because you initiated the fundraiser? No, I believe you can too. Um, you, you can actually share that, uh, that fundraiser and invite people to, to, to be on that fundraise page. Okay. Um, and then my next plan is is just go off another week of, of doing what I'm doing, sh sharing this more. And then uh, by by this weekend, I think I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to share the, the Harness platform page just in case people are not comfortable donating via Facebook. They can donate via the Harness platform. Um, and then I, I think maybe Debbie might want to also just send out a reminder email later on later on the week just to remind club members that they can either donate through the harness if they don't have Facebook or they can contact Patrick to, to drop off a check or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And pa Pat, Patrick, how long, uh, how long is, is this campaign going to run? What's your plan on that? Uh, I think we were running it for, th was it three weeks, Dennis? So it ends on July 29? Yes. Okay. All right. Questions on that, on Hunger Plus? So all you Facebook uh, folks, feel free to like it, share it, get it out there. Do whatever else you do, huh? Um, okay, any other happy dollars? Any sad dollars? All right, anything else we wanna cover before we turn it over to our speaker for the day? Okay, well, um, I think John Townsend, you are the uh, program uh, director for the day, so I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Outstanding, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Greetings, everybody, and it's our, my pleasure to be able to introduce one of our own. And I had the uh, good fortune of actually hearing John present at the Early Bird Club. Uh, it's got to be almost a couple of months ago, I think, John. And after that, I thought, boy, that content is uh, really quite special. I want to uh, go through the idea of inviting him to our club to do the very same thing. So allow me to read a little bit of a neat introduction for John and then we'll turn it over to him. And I know he's got some uh, slides to share as well on a PowerPoint. So if you didn't know, John serves as the Chief Executive Officer for Samoset Council Boy Scouts of America and gives leadership to the operations and administration of that organization, subject to the authority and direction of its executive board. He serves as the Secretary for the Council, the Executive Board and its Executive Committee He's responsible for a lot of things, including strategic planning, fiscal stability, membership growth, program quality, volunteer and community relations for the scouting program within the 13 North Central Wisconsin areas, counties served by the Samoset Council. He himself is an Eagle Scout with 24 years of experience as a professional scouter who began his career in St. Paul, Minnesota, and then Indian Hen Council BSA 
there as well as then moving on to serve as at the Northern Star Council BSA in Fort Snelling, Minnesota, which I think is on the outskirts of the cities. He started as the CEO of our own Samoset Council here in the Wassa area on August 1st. So he's almost got a year in here in Wassa with us. He and his wife, Katie, live in Wassa and they also have three Eagle Scout sons. So that's a pretty great pedigree and uh, I'm certainly excited to see uh, his presentation. So John, please jump in here and uh, give us a whirl through your uh, Samoset Council presentation. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, I just shared my screen. So hopefully y'all can see a 100th anniversary logo we have for Samoset. It's our 100th year, even though scouting has been in the U.S. for 110 years uh, locally in 1920, actually July 30th. So we're coming up to the exact date here in a little bit more than a week. Um, so it's kind of neat. And as you can imagine, some of our 100th anniversary festivities we haven't been able to have because of some of the challenges with, with COVID. Uh, so what I plan to do with you this afternoon is just give you a little bit of overview of Samoset scouting, talk to you a little bit about family scouting. We've been serving more uh, female youth in our program than ever before. Uh, and sometimes it's a little confusing because it's a new program for us. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about COVID realities um, that we've dealt with and are going to continue to deal with, right, much like the club and everybody else on the on the Zoom call today. Uh, and then let you know where we're at with the national organizations, Chapter 11 uh, reorganization. They're going through a bankruptcy, as a lot of you know. Um, Samo said is not, but, uh, you know, we need to watch it closely. And then uh, end it with a little bit of just what we hope to still do for 100th anniversary activities, which in some cases we may need to postpone stuff till next year. So our mission for SAMOSET and vision, uh, vision is a, every youth prepared for tomorrow's challenges and the mission is to provide educational, accessible and inclusive programs that prepare young people for life by living the Scout Oath and Law, uh, which the Scout Oath and Law has been around since 1910, maybe a little bit of changes over the years, but not much at all. It's been a mainstay. The programs that we have, uh, a lot of folks um, are not familiar with our older youth programs, so I'll maybe touch on those a little bit more than the younger programs, but um, Cub Scouting or the elementary program is grades K through five, and uh, essentially each grade level is its own den. It's um, modeled after Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book, and so you're then the Tiger Den as a first grader, a Wolf Den as a second grader, etc. Those Youth are eight to 10 ideally in a group and they meet uh, in a group like that usually once or twice a month and then once a month they'll meet as a Cub Scout pack, the entire group uh, to showcase what they did during their meetings and give out awards and such. So again, that's through grade five or approximately age 10. Scouts BSA, formerly known as Boy Scouts, um, has been co-ed now for 18 months and uh, that's quite different where Cub Scouting is very parent run and, and uh, um, adult run. There are certainly adult leaders in the Scouts BSA program, but one of the main things that the Scout BSA program does for youth is gives them an opportunity to lead in a very safe environment. Uh, a troop is run well when the Scout uh, youth are running it, and even though they're not perfect, then they stumble, and you know, as long as it's a safe situation and not any, uh, thing, anything dangerous that they wanna do for an activity, uh, it's really up to the scouts to, to determine that with the guidance of the adult leaders. Um, and so it's a pretty unique situation where they're in a safe setting and go through some of those leadership challenges, not always do the right thing, but um, learn from their mistakes in a, in a safe environment and get coached on the side in the background where they can go back in and make, uh, make some adjustments to the leadership style if needed. Um, and so it's similar to Cub Scouts, but they're called patrols. They're in groups of eight to 10 youth um, with a patrol that they come up with a name for. They stay in that patrol their, their whole five or six years, however long they're in the scouting program until age 18. Um, and um, uh, they have a choice of moving on to our venturing program if they wanted to, which is technically a few more longer, a few more years longer, um, uh, grades 13 to 20 is that program. Uh, that was a program that it was an offshoot of then exploring um, which is a career exploring program, um, partly because in, uh, in the mid 80s, a lot of uh, girls wanted to be part of scouts, uh, but they couldn't at the time. So uh, the venturing program was created. So 
they couldn't go after the Eagle Scout rank, but could they do? They could do a lot of the outdoor activities and similar awards. Um, and so that's why that program was created. If I were to predict the future, I would say that venturing will disappear because um, the need is not there as much because we do have girls and scouts PSA now. Uh, the exploring program, it's also a little known program, it's career exploring. And uh, locally we have a partnership with the fire department in Wausau and also the police department uh, where they can learn about those career skills um, without necessarily spending money on um, an education yet. And if they don't like it, they can jump to another exploring post is what we have, uh, or they may decide that that's the career they want and then and use that as an opportunity to, you know, get into a fire department or so forth. Uh, any career fear that's out that field that's out there could uh, sponsor an exploring post to expose youth to that type of a, a possible career, um, career project trajectory. And then STEM Scouts is still technically a pilot program. Samoset Council is one of 13 Scout Councils piloting it. Uh, there's about 270 Scout Councils in the US. Uh, we're on year five of our pilot. It's supposed to roll out nationally uh, in one year. And so um, it's just a unique program focusing on the science, technology, engineering, and math that uh, a lot of schools and, and parents are looking for. And it does serve age eight to 18, but locally kind of the sweet spot has been middle and elementary schools. We don't have too many high school STEM, uh, STEM, STEM labs, they're called, for the type of scouting units. You know, as John introduced me, we do serve 13 counties. It's from Adams County and kind of follows the Wisconsin River north, two or three counties wide, all the way up to the Michigan border. Uh, so it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty diverse area. Just over 4,000 members in, in the youth category. Um, 300 youth uh, that are in our outreach programs through partnerships we have with organizations. We handed out just uh, over $70,000 in scholarships in the last year. Some of that is registration scholarships. Probably more than half of that is higher education scholarships, anywhere from $1,000 to $1,500. We've got a nice endowment that um, um, gives out scholarships for Eagle Scout uh, applicants as well as our camp staff applicants. 76 Eagle Scouts during the year 2019. That ranges between 76 and 100 in any given year for our area. Um, you know the cream of the crop, as it were, for scouting. But I've met many, met plenty of people that have never reached Eagle Scout, which they did, and you got a lot of values out of scouting. So it's not all about the Eagle Scout, but at least it's one metric. Whoops, that we um, uh, hold near and dear to to talk about. About 30,000 hours of service uh, last year. That may be through the Eagle Scouts, because as many of you know, they have to do an Eagle Scout leadership service project where they lead it, the youth members. They don't actually you know, do the work. They need to lead a team of volunteers and uh, youth and adults to accomplish whatever it is that they're working on for the community. Scouting for food is also part of the 30,000 service hours that we did in the last year. And as I've said, maybe once or twice, um, maybe even last week that we did like $16,000 in online funding for it this last spring because we couldn't do it physically because of COVID. Just over 1,600 volunteers that work with all these scouting units, including our board and such. Budget is just over 2.6 million in the last couple of years. We have partnerships with seven different United Ways. Uh, our staff is kind of scoped out there. Seasonal staff are in operation right now. Seasonal staff is a little bit lighter than normal because we have a lighter summer uh, camp program just because of uh, COVID things going on. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Governed by a board of uh, 28 volunteers across the uh, 13 county area. And then we have 201 scouting units that uh, are chartered or sponsored by 137 different um, community organizations. And that could be a religious institution, educational institution, um, uh, service clubs sometimes sponsor them, as well as um, some of the schools and PTOs, PTAs. We do have an office that we share with the Girl Scouts. It's technically owned by a, five, a separate 501c3, um, the Wausau Home Service Center. So it's a pretty neat property with the Girl Scouts in the same building. Literally, when you walk up to the building, if you haven't, Girl Scouts are on the right, uh, Samoset Council's on the left. <clears throat> the camp is actually um, Samoset's camp. Um, that's a, about an 80 acre camp right in the heart of the metro greater um, Wausau area. And so camping is a big piece of what we do in scouting. Um, it's kind of the magic. We get them outside, whether it be on a weekend camping trip or just a day activity for younger kids or a week long, um, 
uh, uh, camp at Camp De Somas is our big camp, uh, and the kids are getting values and lessons and things that they don't really um, uh, know that they're getting because they're there for the fun, they're there for going down the zip line, they're there for you know swimming in aquatics, but that they're getting teaching taught these other things that are happening as they learn things about the badges that they're working on. There is um, a main camp is called Crystal Lake Scout Reservation. It's just north of Rhinelander. Technically, has three sub camps to it. And that is Camp Desomas, which is our Scouts PSA camp, Akela's World, which is the Cub Scout camp, the elementary program, and then Hannah High Adventure Base is uh, for youth that maybe have earned a lot of the badges, just looking to go out ATV in or going going down the zip line or other things like that. Uh, that they'll go to that. It's also our winter uh, winter base program because it's camping year round in that area. We have uh, two other primary properties, Camp Phillips I talked about, which is normally weekend use um, for scouting units as well as uh, community use. Uh, I haven't had a lot of either of that in the last three months due to COVID, but in a typical summer, we'd have other uh, organizations as well as scouting units camping on the weekend or during the week, um, during the summertime. And then we have a Flambeau Canoe Base, which is just west of uh, Phillips, Wisconsin, probably about a half an hour uh, outfitting up there in the Flambeau flowage. Tosomas is a regional camp, and normally uh, there's about 10,000 campers that go through there every year. And uh, this year we'll probably be at about a third of that. We open two weeks late. Normally we'd be in session five right now. They're week-long sessions, and we're actually in session three. Uh, we have groups of up to 10 circles of 50 people that can be up there. Those circles never touch. It's one of our COVID uh, protocols. Uh, there are three staff within those circles, and um, uh, they never run into each other, these these groups. Right now, I think there's probably about five different circles of 45 or 50 up there this week, and um, it's been pretty safe so far. Um, food preparation and all that is, uh, or I'm sorry, service has been a whole lot different. Instead of eating in a dining hall type facility, the food is basically going into a carryout container and is brought directly to the scouting units at their campsite to eat in a safe manner. So it's been a lot of being agile and flexible with how the camping program works this summer. Uh, it is year-round outdoor programs, not only for scouts, but also we have school groups, especially from the Rhinelander and the northern part of our council area, um, go to the SOMAS for different outdoor programs, as well as just using the Hannah High Adventure Base for uh, indoor learning that they want to do. The biggest thing they get out of camp is a, a resilience, leadership, teamwork, and part of the camp magic is really the the camp staff. We uh, go through an accreditation process through the National Boy Scouts of America every year. Uh, they were there last Friday to accredit the camp, and we always just get great accolades from uh, the volunteers that do the accreditation process that are not part of SAMOSET, they're National BSA volunteers, and how in tune the camp staff are with our campers, as well as they're pretty impressed with the whole COVID protocols that we had in place. I'm just hoping everybody can stay healthy for the rest of the summer, because if the camp staff comes down with it, uh, we're going to be hurting and have to shut down camp. Family scouting. <clears throat> Uh, again, this started two years ago for our Cub Scouting program, fall to 2018. Right now we have about 250 uh, female Cub Scouts in our programs. Uh, Scouts BSA, which is a little, a little bit older program, starts in grade five, um, grade six. That started in February 2019, so we're about 18 months into it. We're at about 100 uh, Scouts BSA youth right now. That's about typical for a lot of Scout councils that I've seen, but uh, there's always room for improvement. It's a matter of getting the word out there and making sure people know how we're serving the girls and that there's a, a great place for them to join in either Cub Scouts, uh, Scouts BSA or our older youth programs. Um, a lot of people think we're merging with the Girl Scouts, you know, we're not. Um, just uh, making sure that it's full family scouting. Uh, a lot of it came from just uh, parents of existing members saying, well, how come you can't have a program for my daughter? And we did, it's just that you couldn't enter in that program until age 13, so we um, included it for all. So. All the requirements, all the badges, all the Eagle Scout stuff is, is, is all the same. You know, there was just uh, increased training for leaders and such and how to run about having a co-ed program in many cases. Just a little bit about the future. Some of it we've already completed. Um, we've had a capital campaign that was going well before I got here and three of the four projects were already complete. Uh, it was about a $2 million campaign. Uh, it was all focused on improving things that are Crystal Lake Scout Reservation that I just got done talking about. So, you know, um, safety things like storm shelters slash seasonal staff housing, more shower facilities, especially with an influx of more and more female 
leaders and needing more facilities for that, as well as female youth um, and then a storm shelter as part of that same facility. Uh, we have a grand council fire ring that it sees a lot of use and uh, between opening and closing campfires and campfires throughout the week where uh, we did a significant improvement to that just because of some of the uh, erosion and things that were happening in this huge firing area. The last piece to it, it's kind of been moving slowly because of some COVID challenges, but we've got to have a business and technology center at the same camp that includes all those sub bullet points um, underneath it that we're about halfway through raising the money to a $1.2 million expected business and technology center building. What this doesn't say in the lower section there is that it's also an, uh, another bridge to the community um, for schools that may want to come up to the camp and uh, learn some more about some of the things that we have to offer to include, you know, a STEM lab that'll be in there and other things. So it's kind of neat to have that coming down the pike. Realistically, I would say we won't be able to break around on that until maybe a year from this August. I left this slide in here because one of the first presentations I was going to do this spring was for the WASA, I think it was the Kiwanis Club, face-to-face, uh, -face, but then things shut down and we couldn't do it. So this was one slide that I was going to talk about as we were preparing for COVID, you know, and then all of a sudden that happened. Um, so I left that in there just kind of as a kind of a neat four or five months ago what was happening to us then you know during that time we technically shut down on march 13th and through june 12th there were no in-person in scout meetings um, we had only a small crew in the scout office to handle things like payroll and other necessities that needed to be done um, we were pretty set up to, to work from home because a lot of our staff are already mobile. They weren't necessarily working out of their homes, uh, but we were able to adapt pretty quickly to um, Zoom meetings and, you know, um, all of our cell phones get forward, uh, landlines get forward to cell phones. We have VoIP phones, so they support staff that normally would be picking up the phone. All they had to do is plug it into their house in a high-speed internet connection, and it was like you were right at the scout office, so it worked pretty slick. Um, as you can imagine, not unlike probably a lot of your businesses, we've been doing constant budget planning every single month, if not a couple times a month, and uh, really learning to uh, improvise and adapt and overcome um, uh, technology. Things that were challenges in the past, but you just learn to live with them quickly. And I've already talked about scouting for food, but that was kind of a neat thing to do that. Um, right now, we're technically in a phase two reopening. We went into phase one around early June, where we allowed scouting units to meet about up to 10 face to face um, per the you know adult leaders' uh, comfort level and family's comfort level. We started allowing um, weekend camping and uh, weekend day outings for scouting units in the middle of June. And right now, we're technically at a phase two where the, the scout office we're allowing some customers in to the scout shop as well as just transactions that we have whatever it may be for face-to-face -face things but it's um, um, fast masks or face coverings are required when uh, interacting with staff and vice versa with volunteers um, and we haven't had any scout meetings yet in the, in the office but that will also be required to have masks in one of our larger rooms with social distancing of no more than 15 people. So, so far it's been fairly smooth. It's just been making sure that we're in coordination with the Girl Scouts and they're technically still in a phase one. They don't have any volunteers coming in. They're just doing curbside pickup. The other piece before I get into chapter 11 type things is that, um, you know, we've been educating our unit leaders on how to do virtual meetings. We've had virtual campouts. Uh, virtual merit badges where the kids can go online and still get a lot of things done without necessarily having face-to-face in-person meetings with their adult leaders. Um, it's been a bit challenging, but it's been um, a big, um, big eye-opener on how a lot of scouting can be done online without many hiccups at all. So um, there was actually a national camp out in late May where there was huge participation from Samoset Council where kids just camped in their backyard and then shared by social media you know, what they were doing across the country, kind of a neat thing. So National BSA Reorganization, the Chapter 11, they filed for that in early February. And this is all about um, uh, abuse cases from the 1980s and before, um, where people have been coming forward and consistently lawsuits have gone against the national organization that provides the general liability insurance for all scout councils across the country to the point where 
financially they can they couldn't do it anymore and they really need to think of the best way to equitably compensate victims as well as ensure scouting continues in the future and that's a chapter 11 bankruptcy reaction reorganization so they've been doing that for the better part of you know i guess five six months now we're in a, a period of time where they're going through um, claim notifications uh, there's a bar date set for middle of November, and if people have a claim, feel like they were um, abused by scouting, then they can do that through the National BSA, the BSA website. Um, it's unfortunate, but you know the good thing is that the National BSA is trying to create a um, um, a victims' pools of money so that folks can be equitably. Uh, compensated if um, they have been abused when the time comes. Um, the reality is, is that scouting is actually a pretty darn safe place. And, uh, you know, especially from the mid eighties on um, where the youth protection standards, you know, have really increased and believe it or not, were held or, or uh, considered the gold standard. Um, I, when I was in Rotary in the Twin Cities, they may not have the same type of youth protection training here for whatever youth programs that we do. I haven't noticed it yet, but uh, the district uh, Rotary um, organization in the Twin Cities modeled their youth protection training after scouting. Um, the Archdiocese in the Twin Cities modeled their youth protection training after scouting um, because they knew that we were doing a good thing and just you know re redid it for what their needs are so it's uh, it's a pretty pretty safe thing and scouting is just unfortunately in the past some people took advantage of the situation and that's too bad um, and so just know that going forward um, you will probably see some notifications and things that come out in the media um, and uh, we're going to do our best with Samoset uh, to at least let people know that uh, we're here to help serve families and youth and uh, it is a safe place. It's just unfortunately uh, some challenges happened in the past. So, so far there really has, really has not been any impact on uh, Samoset other than my time and a few of my volunteers time to watch things closely so that we don't slip into something that we shouldn't because it is a national chapter 11 bankruptcy, not a Samoset chapter 11 bankruptcy. And then as uh, I close out here before maybe there's a few questions, if we have time for that, it is our 100th anniversary. It's like the 100th anniversary that never happened, as you can imagine, because we had a few things going on in the first couple months of the year. And then uh, the events that we did have planned or things that we wanted to connect to 100th anniversary through existing events just couldn't happen because those events didn't occur. Um, we we do plan on having a July 30th proclamation day at Camp Phillips. Normally it would have been highly publicized, but because of COVID, uh, it's really going to probably be more of just an internal gathering of two sessions of about 75 people each that we think we can do safely at Camp Phillips with a proclamation um, read by one of my volunteers from the governor since uh, it wasn't realistic for him to come under the current conditions or one of his staff. Uh, likely this camp out at Camp Tosomas later in the summer would probably have to be canceled because I just don't think it's realistic for us to pull people together that normally would be several hundred people and it's just not probably a smart thing to do uh, despite that we're doing normal camping operations up there now. Um, and then we'll have a new 5K run and walk event in early November at Camp Phillips to uh, kind of do a fun thing there and then a holiday gala for volunteers late in the fall. So beyond that, we've certainly have had you know, 100th anniversary swag and, and different things online that we've had kids giving us some uh, feedback on and sharing the history of Samoset, Set, which has kind of been a neat thing to, to do, but it's been a little tampered down compared to what we thought it was going to be when we first planned things. So um, we have a pretty, pretty healthy budget right now, thanks to the Paycheck Protection Program and also just um, being able to manage things, but I don't know if I can hold on to that for the next five months. You know, it's a lot can happen in the next five months. So right now we're looking that we're going to have a even budget, but um, we'll see how things shake out. Uh, if we need to, we got some reserves we can dip into, fortunately. So, so that's what's happening with Samoset Council. Um, if there's time for questions, Matt, uh, you know, I'll entertain that, but I understand if maybe people got to get on to the next thing. John, thank you. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, well done. Um, questions for John? We've got a we've got a few minutes. We could we could take some questions if uh, if people have them. John, maybe if you want to stop sharing your screen, you're working on that now. It looks like. Yep. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Questions for John.
Okay. It must have been all encompassing, John. <laughs> sure. <laughs> all right. Um, anything else for the good of the order today? Otherwise, we can close with the four way test. Dr. Dodson's got a question, it looks like. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, John. This is Lisa. Um, I'm just curious what you're doing for families who might not have any resources for online and for other um, assistance that you're providing to families that might not have access to internet or sources they need to take out. I, I can't hear you very well. I heard what. what what are you doing for families that have challenges with online and that I didn't catch the rest? I can't, I can't hear it. Uh, I think, I, yeah, last I time think you, this, you had your microphone and your headset on that worked really well, if that's still available to you. I think maybe that while she's working on that the question is what to do with families who are, are have struggles with technology. John. Sure. Yeah. Because of the northern part of the, the council where we know in general as a community that it's really hard to get connectivity up there. What we did is had um, our staff uh, go, go to schools where a lot of the, the free lunches and stuff were happening and we were handing out um, some program supplies and things not only just for our own participants but just for the general community. Um, and then also we were working with um, uh, the, the local leaders on, you know, where, where can they go with their kids? Like maybe there's a library. I've heard of families driving up to the library parking lot, despite that the library wasn't open to connect and have their kids work on schoolwork. And so we were encouraging them to do that with some of the virtual scouting things. So it's, it's still a huge challenge that we have on our radar screen of how to help them overcome that because it's not going to go away. Okay. Did that cover it, Dr. Batson? Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks. Other questions for John? John, this is John Townsend. I'm just curious about how the scouts that are proceeding right now into their uh, Eagle Scout projects, how are they accomplishing that given the current COVID situation? Usually you're bringing together adults and students to accomplish that. How, how are they uh, uh, working through that challenge to still move forward on their, on their Eagle Scout projects, which is, you know, the uh, ultimate last stop for uh, the work to gain your uh, Eagle uh, award. Sure. Well, uh, it depends upon what type of project they have, if they can do it with social distancing and, and ideally it would be outside or in a large area, um, then they, they can do most of it just with additional precautions, um, especially if it was an outside project, as long as they keep it less than 25 people and keep the distancing and mind cleanliness and things. And a lot of kids will, you know, go to Subway or something and get free food or something like that. And as long as that's all prepackaged um, for those that are going to eat lunch during a project, then that's all fine. Uh, part of the challenge has been if it's an indoor project, not many scouts are able to find a place that will let them in um, that's large enough. As you know, a lot of churches are still doing online and won't even let their own congregation in, um, you know, so, and that's going to pose a problem, not only for that, but also for scouting units that, that meet in the fall. Um, you know, a lot of them will meet at a church or a school and if they're not allowing outside groups, um, then they're going to have to find an alternative location to do it. So, so, so far, the, despite that the Eagle projects, um, they've had some challenges of not being able to do it in the middle of COVID. Now that there has been some restriction lifting, despite that, we might go backwards on some of the restrictions and tighten them up again because of some of the numbers are going up. Um, I haven't seen much of a change in the number of applications for Eagle Scouts coming in in their projects. There was a bit of a dip though in May and early June. Thanks for that question. Okay. Anything else? All right, hearing none, we'll close with the four-way test. Let me tell you what I'm going to do going forward, given that we're going to be Zooming for a, a while here, it looks like. I, you know, for whatever reason, we never seem to be in sync on our, on our uh, communication. So I'm going to pick somebody each week uh, to recite the four-way test in the closing, and everybody else can just lip sync on mute or whatever. Now, I'm going to be kind to everybody, and I'm going to do it myself this week. And then, but be prepared. You may, you may get called on in the future to uh, recite the four-way test. So, um, so 
we'll close with the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Mm -hmm. Is it fair to all, all concerned? concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll close the meeting. See you later. Thanks.